54 as we lift up our hearts in praise and worship to the Lord. Let's go ahead and commit this time to him, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to come here into this place today. Father, we look forward to what you have for us today. We thank you especially for Jesus and the hope that we have, the peace that we have. And Father, we just pray that you would be blessed right now as we focus our minds and hearts on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't we go ahead and stand for this uh, first one? Majesty, worship his majesty unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority, flow from his throne unto his own, his anthem reigns. So exalt, lift up on high. Jesus the King, majesty, worship his majesty, Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings, Jesus who died, now glorified, King of of all kings. Lord, our oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Yeah. 
is in you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mighty power and love for all of us. And dear Jesus, thank you for this wonderful day that we have before us. And I'd just like to pray as many of us are going to be heading out that you keep us safe, help us to stay alert. And I just pray you'd bless Steve as he shares your wonderful creation with all of us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Pull out your bulletin if you have one this morning, and we'll take a look at this morning's announcements. Things are a tad bit different here this morning. We're going to be going on a uh, um, on a um, off road trip this morning, so we're dressed a little bit more casually than normal. Uh, but uh, it's comfortable uh, to be here. Also with our children's ministry this morning, we're inviting the older class to stay in and to be able to listen to Dr. Austin if you'd like to. If you want, you can go into the younger class. They have stuff that's prepared for uh, all ages back there, but we're still going to be having the younger kids in junior church. And uh, again, for uh, the older class, if you'd like to stay in, we'd love to have you there. Uh, we do have the trip that's uh, on today. It is filled up. We had just a tremendous response to be able to go out on the field trip. And so those of you who have signed up, those of you who, that I've talked to or Ryan have talked to, we're going to be leaving immediately following the service. So um, please go to your vehicles and uh, we'll be heading out the, the southeast side out here, okay? Um, also, I want to remind you that on April 13th, we begin Truth Quest for the junior high and high schoolers. And uh, those of you who are junior high and high school, I just encourage you to go and be a, a part of that as Pastor Ryan brings forth the truth of God's word and a way to stand in the midst of, of some challenging days that we live in. Um, by the way, just a little bit of a plug, we went and saw God's Not Dead. Has anybody seen that movie yet? That's, a, that's, a, that's one to go see out in the theaters right now. Uh, real real uh, powerful film and standing up for the faith and all. Also, we have um, our Good Friday service that's coming up on April 18th at 6 p.m. where we will be having uh, worship, scripture reading, and communion. And then our three Easter services on Resurrection Sunday, 6 o'clock out here on the lawn for sunrise. And then out in Ocotilla Wells, we're going to be at the cross <clears throat> at the airfield at 8.30, and then back here in the sanctuary for another uh, service at 10 o'clock. And so we're going to have a great time uh, then. I also um, just looked over here to my right and saw Brian Schmader. I just uh, He's going to be leaving tomorrow for Peru. Brian's been here since infancy. He was baby Jesus. <laughs> I hope that doesn't embarrass you, but he was baby Jesus in our Christmas play years ago. He uh, went to Calvary Chapel Bible College, spent his last semester in Israel, and has graduated, has been leading our men's group for the last year and doing just a fabulous job. And now he's leaving for Peru tomorrow for a couple of months. So I would just like for us to lift him up in prayer right now as he's going to be going and just that he'd have an open mind and heart as, as uh, uh, he goes and serves the Lord over there. Father, we want to thank you so much for Brian. What a, what a wonderful man of God. And thank you for working in his life and how he's blessed us in the men's group here at the church, especially and we pray for safety as he goes down to Peru. And we also pray that you just open up whatever doors that, that you have for him. Please help him to be sensitive to your leading. And it's just exciting to see what you're doing in his life. Please bless him and his family, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. At this time, I would like to introduce to you, this would be the time for the younger kids to be going out to... Uh, uh, their junior church class, if you want to go ahead and, and head out. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Steve Austin, creation scientist and geologist. Let's give him a warm welcome. Good to be with you. Enjoy the fellowship of uh, the Christian Center here in Borrego Springs again. This is the third year I've been back. Thank you for... Uh, joining us uh, on this field trip, too. This is going to be a, a good day. Okay, uh, let's bring up that first slide. Borrego Springs Geology, Geology of uh, Anza Borrego Desert. Uh, do you realize what a wonderful place that you live in? Yes. Right here. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay, I've been all over the world, okay, on doing geology on six major continents. And if you don't appreciate what you have here in uh, Brego Springs, boy, you, uh, you're missing it. Okay, well, uh, I would like to um, take the museum people, the seminary people, and you people here in the church out to, to Split Mountain today, and let's look at some of the things that God has made. Let me give you some orientation and then uh, we'll begin. I like reading the Psalms. And the psalmist, 10, Psalm 104, David, is uh, rehearsing in his mind, in kind of a hymn of praise, what God has done in creation. And I'll take you there and we'll look at that passage. Um, uh, Psalm 104, 5 through 9. He establishes the earth upon its foundations so that it will not totter forever and ever. You cover it, that's the earth, with a deep as with a garment. The waters were standing above the mountains. At your rebuke, they fled. The mountains rose, the valley sank down to the place which you established for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass over, so that they will not return to cover the earth. Now, there's a lot in that passage, okay? Uh, he's uh, rehearsing day three of creation about establishing the earth upon its foundations, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? The, the question that God asked Job in Job chapter 38. Uh, he established the earth on its foundations, day three. He gathered the oceans together into basins, and the dry land appeared. Uh, then, uh, verse 6, you covered it with a deep as with a garment. The waters were standing above the mountains. Probably a reference to global flood in Noah's day. So the, the flood, and uh, then at, thy re, at your rebuke, they fled. The waters fled. With the sound of your thunder, they hurried away. And he's probably reflecting back on Psalm 29, where the, the voice of the Lord's psalm is involved with the flood. Then verse 8, which is the one I want to kind of focus on today, because it's uh, kind of awesome to see it right here in Borrego. The mountains rose, the valley sank down to the place which you just established for them. Okay, you said about, okay, and uh, that's talking about the late flood and post-flood faulting that created the landscape out here. And uh, if, you, if you can claim a verse, uh, take that one uh, out in the field with you. And then verse 9, you set a boundary that they may not pass over so that they will not return to cover the earth. Probably a reference to the co Noahic covenant that followed the flood that God would never flood the earth again. It was the flood last time. It's the fire next time. Okay, so that's a, kind of the, the, the comfort that uh, David has in this uh, psalm. Okay, Brego Springs features. Okay, boy, do we have some good features out here in Brego Springs. Okay, uh, mountains. Okay, uh, appreciate mountains. Most of the mountains are caused by um, faults. See, fault movement creates uh, down faulted areas and uplifted areas, and uh, that's typically the mountains. And the mountains around Borrego Springs are largely granite, a, an igneous rock that cooled from molten uh, material, and metamorphic rock. Rock w was here before the magma came in and cooled, and it was cooked. The pressure cooked uh, metamorphic rocks, and those are what makes the mountains around uh, Borrego. Then we have alluvial fans. Appreciate alluvial fans building out from uh, these uh, gullies and streams, and they, they fan out over the surface. Some great examples. Here and Death Valley are some of the primo examples of alluvial fans in the world. And then we have bajadas. Those are coalescing alluvial fans. Uh, Mescal bajada out there by uh, over Yaki Point. Um, I'm thinking of something like that, and it, it, those, are, those are classics. And then uh, we have uh, playas. Playa is a Spanish word, which means dried up lake, okay, or beach, something like that. Playa. And a playa is a, a, a dry lake. And, of course, we have uh, Clark Dry Lake here. And we have Benson Dry Lake, over Benson by uh, Borrego Springs, or um, by um, uh, Ocotillo Wells. And then uh, we have the, the landform called pediment. Pediment, and a pediment is a sloping erosional surface, usually covered with gravel. 
And a good example is I see those along San Felipe Creek. You, you local people here might appreciate big, the biggest drainage in central Anza Borrego is uh, San Felipe Creek, and uh, it largely is an erosional, so sloping erosional surface. It might look like an alluvial fan, a bunch of piles of boulders, but it's something a little bit different. And then, of course, we have the sand dunes, and uh, boy, some good sand dunes out here, and uh, um, always uh, interesting to study. And then Badlands. The Badlands erosion, and Fonts Point is an excellent example of that. And uh, we did that on our field trip yesterday, and we'll see some more Badlands, uh, Fish Creek Badlands, go through Split Mountain on Split Mountain Road south of Ocotillo Wells. And you see that uh, enormous terrain, about 54 square mile area of Badlands out there, uh, south of uh, Split Mountain. And of course, all that drainage comes through Split Mountain and issues out on Fish Creek Fan. And Fish Creek alluvial fan is uh, huge, but it's uh, not, to be, not the place to be during a uh, giant rainstorm or anything like that. And don't want to be in the gorge about that time. Although uh, I've, I've endured some of those type of, ex of, of events myself. Okay, those are desert features, like for example, the alluvial fan and Palm Canyon here, big alluvial fans, a building out from the San Ysidro Mountains, that kind of thing. So alluvial fans are very prominent. We, uh, um, we appreciate this, uh, that it's just the intermittent flood that brings the boulders out. Okay, uh, whoops, back to that. Uh, here is Fonts Point, Badlands, right? And uh, we were out, uh, our, our geology group was out yesterday. We were talking about uh, the Badlands, and those are Badlands, okay? And it's, uh, um, it's not farming country out here, okay? <laughs> Okay, and plants don't stabilize on that kind of slope because there is continual erosion and the soil can't build up. And so it's an eroded terrain. It's called rill and gully topography. And of course, we know Badlands of South Dakota, but you, have, you don't have to go there. Uh, you got it right here. And you probably have better Badlands here, more accessible than uh, they do out in South Dakota. Okay, and uh, what a place to talk about the Salton Trough and all of the things around Borrego Valley. Okay, uh, there is Fonts Point. You can stand and drive out. You, you drive out to the parking lot and you walk the short quarter mile hike out to there and then you overlook that Badlands. What an amazing thing to see. And uh, lots of us uh, sit out there and ponder it. One of the characteristics of Borrego Badlands is it has a sandstone layer on top here, and that's called the Fonts Point Sandstone, and that sandstone layer is about 20 feet thick, and it hold, it's very durable, and so it holds up the plateau that's behind it, but underneath it, it gives way, and that's the mud hills there underneath it, so we have the mudstone. Now, I'll talk to you about that, uh, how that mud got there, but this is the old delta of the Colorado River. Did you know the Colorado River filled in uh, Borrego Valley and Fonts Point? We'll talk more about that. Here's a, a brief uh, look at uh, Earth's geology from a biblical view. The folded sandstone strata in Anza Borrego Desert show the force of tectonics and faulting. And uh, we, we want to put all this in kind of a biblical perspective. The, the uh, the rocks made before the flood are uh, down there deep in the Grand Canyon, and they're down deep under this valley here. We'll go way down, we could probably find those rocks. Uh, there's igneous and metamorphic rocks down there. Those are rocks before the flood. And then we see flat-lying strata in Grand Canyon, rocks made during the flood, and there's about 4,000 feet of those. Those rocks are over in the Chocolate Mountains, over on the other side of the San Andreas Fault on the eastern side of uh, Salton Sea. And uh, those same, some of those same rocks right down there, those rocks, uh, those sandstones and shales and limestones are over just on the other side of the Salton Sea. Here, the rocks got pressure cooked, and uh, they've been changed. And as you drive up uh, S-22 going towards Santa Isabel, you can see some of the pressure cooked rocks that are like, were, were probably originally like that, but they've been cooked by that uh, molten uh, um, material, that magma that intruded. Okay. 
Um, now, in the mountains around here, we see some of these rocks. In the Grand Canyon, for example, this is a crystalline rock that may, may have been made during creation week. Sorry. Sorry about that. Right here, the magma, the magma rock. Yeah. And uh, this crystalline kind of rock is a rock that's associated with creation week. And also, some of that may have been made here locally by the molten material that was injected into the Earth's crust probably during the flood and cooked the, the uh, flood sediments. Okay, uh, that creation week rock and uh, some of the rock that formed after creation week is interesting. And then here you see in the Grand Canyon some of the pre-flood rocks, rocks produced probably by uplift on day three of creation week. Now on day three of creation week, Genesis 1, 9, and 10, God said, let the waters be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the gathering together of the waters, he called them seas, and, the, and then the dry land was formed. And uh, this is a very um, elaborate uh, uh, um, scripture to describe how God made the, the ultimate water collection reservoir, the ocean. And, and caused the foundations of the earth to be formed. And uh, we see tilted sedimentary rocks, probably from day three of that big uh, slosh event uh, in the bottom of Grand Canyon. Imagine day three, you're an angel, and we, we believe that angels are there on day three of creation week because of what's said in uh, Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38, the sons of God shouted together for joy as they're watching uh, uh, creation, evidently. And so uh, angels are there during creation week. Suppose an angel blinked on day two as God <laughs> created uh, the, the expanse or the light on day one. You know, what would, uh, uh, the, the angel would not have seen the power of God expressed. But on day three of creation week, every angel saw 340 million cubic miles of water collected together into seas. And so you can understand something of the power of God by imagining that. And so God's expressed his eternal power and divine nature by making the seas on day, day three of creation week, I believe. Okay, you can see this, uh, the rocks formed from before the flood. I think there was an ocean over most of uh, the southwestern United States. We see it in Grand Canyon. Those rocks have been tipped up probably related to the tectonics of the early part of the global flood. And then we see flat-lying strata in Grand Canyon, and over there in Dinosaur National Monument, we have a bunch of carcasses of, of, uh, of dinosaurs, 1,500 uh, bones on that one ledge at Dinosaur National Monument. And you see articulated skeletons of dinosaurs. Those were washed in and hit by some type of powerful mud flow or catastrophe, and they're buried there. And um, whole animals, okay, uh, large animals, things like that. That is, that is remarkable. The fossil record has a lot to, uh, to study. And uh, then we have the rocks made after the flood. And, then and what better place to study those rocks than right here in Borrego Springs? And, of course, we get some idea of the scale. Out at Canyon Sonombre, you can see the, the bent strata associated with the Coyote Mountains uh, down there south uh, along the Elsinore Fault down there by Ocotillo. So uh, we have all kinds of good, really good things to, to look at here. Okay, animals and man repopulated the earth from Mount Ararat and the Tower of Babel. Okay, the animals probably sp sp spread rapidly very quickly and then humans said, nah, we're not, it, it's bad out there. We're, we're, we're sticking around. And uh, they, they built a tower, and you know that story. And, uh, but anyway, they finally got distributed over the earth. And uh, so that's uh, kind of the, uh, the story of distribution. Okay, and then following the flood was the Ice Age itself. The Ice Age. And uh, in the Rocky Mountains and in the Sierra Nevada, we had big glaciers, and that's following the flood. And those glaciers were there. And of course, then we had the, the building of the Colorado River Delta in uh, the Borrego Springs area. Okay, and uh, have you heard about the mammoth excavations out here? Okay, some really uh, very interesting um, 
uh, mammal fossils, lots of real interesting mammoth fossils, big tortoises, like tortoise 10 foot long, that kind of thing. There are some huge animals out here, and uh, evidently big oasis, as this was sitting there after the flood, uh, the, there was... Uh, the big Colorado River Delta, and then the Colorado River for some reason left, and it formed a lake in here. And a lot of uh, lush environment in the post-flood period. wasn't dry like now, okay, and those animals uh, had a great time here. And uh, good fossil record. Now, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the uh, uh, regional geology so you can put that in perspective. And uh, I've drawn this map to give you the geologic perspective. The, uh, um, here we see the Salton Trough, which is the major landform in uh, the Borrego de Desert area, the Salton Trough. And the Salton Trough is along the San Andreas Fault. Okay, and then we have the San Jacinto Fault, and we have the Elsinore Fault, and then we have the Clark Fault, and uh, the uh, Coyote Creek Fault running right through Borrego Springs. And that's what's kind of shown here. And uh, this great tectonic shift called a right lateral strike slip fault, that's the uh, San Andreas fault system, goes down into the Gulf of California where that fault is kind of transformed along a zigzag out to what's called the East Pacific Rise. And you may have heard about this underwater mountain range called the East Pacific Rise out there. The East Pacific Rise goes under northern uh, Mexico, okay, underneath uh, Sierra Madre, that area, but the horizontal shifting occurred and it broke Baja from uh, mainland Mexico and it broke uh, western California from uh, eastern California. And so that creates this amazing thing. And this is the this is the plate boundary, or the boundary between what's called the North American plate and the uh, Pacific plate. And the Pacific plate's out here, and, and then we have the North American plate. Lately, the Pacific plate has been moving north uh, to the northwest relative to North America and has created this horizontal shift uh, faults. And the horizontal fault, right strike slip fault, that uh, fault system, we believe, has 150 miles of slip along the, the Great San Andreas Fault. Okay, and um, I know it's not nice to think about the San Andreas Fault because it's kind of close, isn't it? Okay, and, and when's the last time we had a magnitude 8 earthquake on the San Andreas Fault in Southern California? Ooh, 150 years? More than that. Okay, so uh, maybe we're, uh, we're, we're expecting an earthquake. Uh, I felt the Brawley quake. I've, you know, I've lived in San Diego a lot, and so, he's, and you guys have, have no doubt uh, felt many of the quakes here. Uh, anyway, the the, San, the Salton Trough is very active tectonically, and it's uh, what is very interesting about the Salton Trough is it's a mirror image of the Dead Sea Basin, and I just came from studying the Dead Sea Basin in uh, Jordan, <clears throat> so uh, the Dead Sea and salt and trough are just, uh, they're mirror images of each other. Just look at it in a mirror. Just take a mirror and look at uh, the landforms here and there, and, and you, can, you can see it. Left lateral strike slip fault in uh, the Dead Sea. Well, anyway, that's the, the general picture. Now, here's what I think happened, and most uh, geologists would kind of favor this explanation. But the, the idea is originally the, the, the Pacific Ocean floor was thrust directly at the North American continent. And when that happened, when the Pacific uh, Ocean Basin was shoved against southwestern North America, what happened? The ocean floor, because it's higher density, was shoved underneath the North American plate. And the process, you may have heard the word subduction, the process called subduction occurred, and ocean floor was shoved underneath western uh, North America. And as that happened, it generated all kinds of scraped off sediment, which got down deep in the earth and got hot. And so it came up, 
and formed magma that intruded the sediment that was accumulated along the, the margin of this uh, uh, big continental um, collision zone. And uh, that got formed, and uh, that led to the big uh, evidence of the, of the collision. And uh, Alaska is a good model for what that collision is like, a head-on collision. Okay, so a head-on collision occurred, and then what happened is the, the direction was changed, about 90 degrees. So we had rapid uh, motion of the Farallon ocean floor plate northeastward, under thrusting the continent's western edge. And then the, the motion slowed down quite a bit. It may have been moving at three feet per second, okay, uh, a fast walking pace. So I call it continental sprint, okay, <laughs> not continental drift. So continental sprint was occurring. And then what happened is the, uh, the East Pacific rise was under thrust Western North America. And as that happened, this whole thing changed direction and it slowed down. And now we have northwestward shearing after the arrival of the Pacific Plate. And so this whole thing has changed. That's kind of an uh, interesting map to think about. Now, uh, we can look at the terrain around here. Of course, what is, we'll talk about what salt and trough is, but you see all this extended terrain in the basin and range, the Great Valley, the Sierra Nevada, and uh, the continental borderland, uh, Southern California, and uh, down into Baja and this, the whole western United States and, uh, and, and northwestern uh, Mexico have been uh, affected. Uh, one thing is interesting is the Colorado Plateau did not shear. It doesn't have a huge amount of faulting. What happened basically to the Colorado Plateau is it's uplifted. It was just simply uplifted since the flood. And so we see the whole flood strata sequence and the, the history of the earth in one cross section there. You know, it's over a mile deep uh, in the Colorado uh, Plateau, Grand Canyon. Okay, and uh, because of the faults here, it was uplifted and stayed intact. Same with Sierra Madre Occidental in northwestern Mexico. Then the basin and range was extended and sheared, uh, right shear. And so was Death Valley. Death Valley is very much like salt and trough. And then uh, the Sierra Nevada mountains are just block faulted and the Great Valley was down uh, warped. And, uh, and of course, uh, Baja California, which was originally up against the mainland Mexico, it pulled apart, forming the Gulf of California. All that happened uh, in the late flood and the post-flood period. How do you like that for a, a summary? Is that uh, <laughs> kind of... Okay, and it's fun to go to these places and, and look at those things. Now, here's, here's our map of uh, the salt and trough, and you see this area is below sea level, okay? And uh, it was occupied by a lake just four or 500 years ago. There was uh, Lake Cahuilla that was here, and the Indians described the lake at about 39 feet above sea level, okay? And it was six times the size of Salton Sea, Six times the area. Okay, and that was a huge lake. And in the last uh, four or 500 years, that lake uh, diminished down to nothing. And by about 1903, in 1903, that's when the, the lake was dried up. Then the Mexican government uh, made a dike in the Colorado River to get water into the uh, irrigation system in Mexico, and unfortunately, they diverted the whole Colorado River, not half the Colorado River. After a rainstorm on the Gila River, this dike broke or diverted the river, and we had for three years unimpeded water of the Colorado River flowing into the Salton Trough, forming the Salton Sea. What, 50 miles long? Uh, lake formed in uh, three years, okay, and it was the world, one of the world's uh, largest man-made act, natural act, man-made accidents at the time, okay, it was something. Okay, and anyway, in that, uh, in this area, we see the, the, the thing. Now, I want to talk to you about the San Andreas Fault, the San Andreas Fault, which comes along and kind of ends and steps into the Gulf of California, 
right through here. Uh, and um, <clears throat> we have the San Jacinto Fault Zone, which splits, and the northern split is called the Clark Fault, and the southern split is called the Coyote Creek Fault. And isn't it great that geologists name their faults after, or California's fault after uh, physical areas? So uh, Coyote Creek Fault is the fault that runs right up, up Coyote Creek, and we, uh, we have um, wonderful display of the fault activity, especially in the northern part of uh, uh, that canyon. Okay, there is uh, Coyote Mountain standing out there and Fonts Point would be out here, and uh, then Clark Dry Lake. Clark Lake, and then we have the Santa Rosa Mountains. So we have the Santa Rosa Mountains, and then we have the uh, Santa Isabel Range around uh, Borrego Springs. <clears throat> we have the horizontal shifting fault, and I'll talk to you about another type of fault that's been recently discovered and appreciated right here in Borrego Springs. Yaki Ridge was the place it started. We, we discovered there was a horizontal fault under a large area of uh, the Borrego uh, Springs, on, and it's called the West Salton Detachment Fault. West Salton Detachment Fault. West Salton Detachment Fault is this giant landslide on the eastern side of the Salton Trough. And it is, uh, it's real interesting to, to study. And you can see the, a little bit closer look, you can see the Salton uh, Sea. The present level of Salton Sea is something down there about 234 feet below sea level. And uh, the old shoreline was up there at 39 feet above sea level. That's the shoreline from Lake Cahuilla, which was huge. And then uh, here we are in um, a Borrego um, Valley. Okay, and here's Borrego Springs up here. Here's the Coyote Creek Fault coming down. There's West Butte, East Butte of Borrego Mountain. Here is the Fish Creek Mountains. And over there is San Felipe Hills, Santa Rosa Mountains, and there's the Clark Fault, the Clark Fault going across, and then they see the location of this huge uh, detachment slide complex. Okay, you can do this with your hands. Okay, um, let's do it. <laughs> okay, take your hand and face your palm toward you, and then turn it, put your elbow up in the air, and then put your other hand your, le your right hand uh, there, and uh, cock your thumb like you see here, right there, and you've simulated the San Andreas Fault coming down to the Salton Trough. And then, then what you do is you pull your right hand away from your left hand along that, and you generate a diamond-shaped hole. See the diamond-shaped hole? Okay, that's the salt and trough. Okay, now uh, that probably happened very rapidly. I don't think it took millions of years to form the salt and trough, not, not 25 million years or something like that at the rate at which your fingernail grows. I think it was big earthquakes in the past and small earthquakes today. So as that opened, some amazing things happened. As, the, as it opened, gravity collapsed the pit this triangle or uh, this uh, diamond shaped pit in map view collapsed and gravity filled in the hole. And the breakaway, this is the West Salton detachment fault. Now, right out here uh, on, in the Santa Isabel range, we have a little bit of it, but out of Yaki Point and up in the Santa Rosa Mountains, it's very obvious, this horizontal fault. Probably mountain slid something like 10 kilometers, uh, but maybe even more. And uh, a geologist friend of mine who I helped lead to Christ, this man has a, a, an understanding of uh, Yaki Ridge being a gigantic landslide that came out of uh, San Felipe, head of San Felipe Creek. And um, it, it met, you can take these rocks, these mountains, and put them back like a jigsaw puzzle. And uh, so this kind of thing is fascinating. It's called, the, the key, the, the word is detachment fault. Detachment faults. So you have strike-slip faults. Those are those horizontal shear faults that are vertical, like San Andreas. And then you have these horizontal uh, faults, or very low-angle faults, two-degree slope, something like that. Okay, and then we have the basin f filling with sediment. So when you form this gigantic depression called the Salton Trough uh, 
pull-apart basin, whatever you want to call it, it filled with sediment. Okay, and the Fonts Point is an uplifted section that shows you some of that uh, strata that were deposited. And the, and the, um, uh, the thickness of the strata can be seen out of Split Mountain. So we're going to go out to Split Mountain, and in the Split Mountain area, we can see 18,000 feet of tipped up strata. Can you believe that? More strata here in Brago <laughs> than in Grand Canyon. Okay, it's just a little bit uh, harder to see them all in one uh, viewing because they're not up as, as same perspective. Uh, there, there's Fonts Point out there, and I flew by it and just photographed. There's the mud strata that were the delta of the Colorado River. In the post-flood period, uh, there was no Colorado River, probably a lake on the Colorado Plateau breached its dam across northern Arizona. The Colorado River broke loose as a giant flood. It came down here into Salton Trough, which is also forming about that time, and uh, filled it in, 18,000 feet of strata. Okay, that would be, uh, that would be uh, worth watching. Okay, so Grand Canyon, the geologic uh, consequence of the flood was this uplifted plateau in northern Arizona, lakes on the Colorado Plateau breaching the dam, and we had catastrophic erosion through Grand Canyon. Almost all geologists now have junked the idea the Colorado River cut Grand Canyon. You start talking to geologists seriously about what made the Grand Canyon and you know what all everything we learned in grammar school about uh, Grand Canyon you know the Colorado River cut Grand Canyon over 70 million years you you disproved it right here in Borrego Springs by looking at the delta and the pre-delta sediment but anyway it looks like it broke loose very rapidly and and lately so uh, geologists are saying that the Colorado River was positioned in Grand Canyon during a fraction of a million years all of a sudden, it, it appears. I like that idea. For a really small fraction of a million years, maybe. Okay, uh, Coyote Creek Fault. Okay, and Borrego Springs would be down here, just off the, the lower uh, left. We have the Coyote Creek Fault running along uh, the Borrego Badlands right here. And it runs down toward uh, the Fish Creek Mountains. And it's a right sheer fault. And then we have the San Jacinto Fault Zone. Okay, we're looking northeast, oblique uh, Google Earth shot. Okay, and we see the San Jacinto or Coyote Creek Fault. That's better to call that the Coyote Creek Fault. And then we have the Santa Rosa Mountains there, and we have the Truck Haven Pediment, and we have Salton City out there, and there's the Salton Sea, and then beyond that is the uh, San Andreas Fault Chocolate Mountains on the other side. Okay, Split Mountain, that's where we're going today. So take some time here and uh, uh, just reflect upon Split Mountain. Uh, we'll, we'll stop right here at this cliff. Uh, there is, uh, in the center of Split Mountain, a giant upwarp structure called an anticline. And on that anticline, there's a big fault. There's some faults here, horizontal shear faults. Two different directions, those faults come through there. And I would like you not to see a fault. I would like you to feel a fault. Have you ever felt a fault? Okay, you run your hand on the fault surface, and you can tell which way the fault slipped, what, which way the breakage occurred in the rock. Okay, and we're going to do that. Okay, and uh, that's really a neat place. And there's a 1,000-foot cliff right there. Okay, that's a pretty significant cliff. Okay, and, and uh, aren't you glad it's not, we're not having an earthquake today? Uh, 